Warren and Charlie, my name is Brent Muyo. I'm from Winnipeg, Canada. First, thank you for devoting so much time and energy to education. I'm a better investor because of your efforts. But more importantly, I'm a better partner, friend, son, brother, and soon-to-be first-time father. There's nothing more important than these relationships, and my life is better because you're willing to pass on your experience and wisdom. My path into finance was unconventional. I worked as an engineer for 12 years, while two years ago I began a career in finance working for the Civil Service Superannuation Board, a $7 billion public pension fund in Winnipeg. I work on alternative investments, which include infrastructure, private equity, and private credit. I go to work every day knowing that I'm there to benefit the hardworking, current, and future beneficiaries of the fund. Like most asset classes, alternative purchase multiples have increased. More of these assets are funded with borrowed money, and the terms and covenants on this debt are essentially non-existent. With this in mind, and knowing the constraints of illiquid, closed-end funds, please give me your thoughts on private alternative investments, their relevancy in public pension funds, and your view on long-term return expectations. Yeah, if you would leveraged up investments uh, in just common stocks uh, and you'd figured a way so that that uh, you would have staying power if there were any market dip. I mean, you'd obviously have re obtained extraordinary returns. I pointed out in my investing lifetime you know, an index fund would do 11 percent. Well, imagine how you'd have done if you'd leveraged that up 50 percent, whatever the prevailing rates were over time. So a leveraged investment in a business is going to beat an unleveraged investment in a good business a good bit of the time. But as you point out, the covenants to protect debt holders as have really de deteriorated in the business. And of course, you've been in a, an up market for businesses and you've got a period of low interest rates. So it's been a very good time for it. I, my personal opinion is if you take, if you take unleveraged returns against unleveraged common stocks, uh, I do not think what is being purchased today and marketed today would work well. But if, if you can borrow money, if you can buy assets that will yield 7 or 8 percent and you can borrow enough money at 4 or 5 percent and you don't have any covenants to meet, you're going to have some bankruptcies, but you're going to also uh, have better results in many cases. It's not, a, it's not something that interests us at all. We, we are not going to leverage up Berkshire. If we'd leveraged up Berkshire, we'd have made a whole lot more money, obviously, over the years. But uh, both. Charlie and I probably have seen some more high IQ people, really extraordinarily high IQ people, destroyed by leverage. We saw long-term capital management where we had people who could do in their sleep math that we couldn't do, or at least I couldn't do, you know, working full-time at it during the day. And I mean, really, really smart people working with their own money and with years and years of experience of what they were doing and, and uh, you know, it all turned to pumpkins and mice in 1998 and, and each actually was a source of national concern, uh, just a few hundred people. And then we saw some of those same people after that happened to them once go out and do the same thing again. So it's, uh, uh, I, would, I would not get excited about so-called alternative investments. There's, you can get all kinds of different figures, but there may be, there's probably at least a trillion dollars committed uh, to buying, in effect, buying businesses. And if you figure they're going to leverage them, you know, two for one on that, you may have three trillion of buying power trying to buy businesses in a well, the U.S. market may be something over 30 trillion now, but there's all kinds of businesses that aren't for sale in that thing. So the supply-demand situation for buying businesses privately and leveraging them up has changed dramatically 
from what it was 10 or 20 years ago. And I'm sure it doesn't happen with your Winnipeg operation, but, but we have seen a number of proposals uh, from private equity funds where the returns are really not calculated in a, in a manner that, uh, well, I, they're not calculated in a manner that I would regard as honest. And uh, 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 so I, it, it's, 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 it's not something, I, uh, if I were running a pension fund, I would be very careful about what was being uh, offered to me. If you have a choice in Wall Street between being a great analyst or being a great salesperson, uh, the salesperson is the way to make it. If you can, if you can raise ten billion dollars in a fund and you get a one and a half percent fee and you lock people up for ten years, you know, you and your children and your grandchildren will never have to do a thing if you are the dumbest investor in the world. And Charlie, well, I, I think what we're doing will work more safely than what he's doing, and but I. I wish you well. Yeah, Brent, you sound, you sound, actually, you sound like a guy that I would hope would be working for a public pension fund, because, frankly, most of the, most of the institutional funds, you know, the, the, well, we had this terrible, uh, right here in Omaha, and uh, you, can, you can get a story of what happened with our, with our Omaha Public Schools Retirement Fund, and they were doing fine, and until, uh, um, the manager started uh, going in a different direction, and the and the trustees here, perfectly decent people, and the manager had done okay to that point, and it yeah, became they, they were smarter in Winnipeg than they are here. Yeah, well, <laughs> that was pretty bad here. It's not a fair fight, actually, when a, usually when a bunch of public officials are listening to people who are motivated to. Uh, we really just get paid for raising the money. Uh, everything else is gravy after that. But but uh, uh, you, know, you if you run a fund and you get even one percent, you know, of of of, of a billion, you're getting ten million dollars a year coming in. And if you've got the money locked up for a long time, uh, it's it, it's a very one-sided deal and. You know, I told the story of asking the guy one time in the past, how in the world can you, uh, why in the world can you ask for two and 20 when you really haven't got any kind of uh, evidence that you uh, are going to do better with the money than you do in an index fund? And he said, well, that's because I can't get three and 30. You know? <laughs> what I don't like about a lot of the pension fund investment is I think they like it because they don't have to mark it down as much as it should be in the middle of the panics. I think that's a silly re reason to buy something because you're given leniency in marking it down. Yeah, and when you commit the money, in the case of private equity often, uh, you, uh, they don't take the money, but you pay a fee on the money that you've committed and of course, you really have to have that money to come up with it at any time. And of course, it makes their return look better if you sit there for a long time in treasury bills, which you have to hold because they can call you up and demand the money, and they don't count that. They count it in terms of getting a fee on it, but they don't count it in terms of what the so-called internal rate of return is. It's, 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 uh, it's not as good as it looks. And, and I really do think that when you have a group sitting as a state pension fund. Or all they're doing is lying a little bit to make the money come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, that, that sums it up. <laughs> <laughs>